I'll let Janet introduce our speaker for today. So um, I'd like to introduce Celeste Goulding as our speaker today. Some of you may recognize her as presenting to us in the past with information on the cold weather shelter at UCC. Today, she will be presenting on Second Home. It's a program of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon where she coordinates host home matches for un unaccompanied high school students and works at developing youth leadership opportunities in Western Washington and Lincoln counties. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in social work from Pacific University and received her master's in social work from the University of Washington. She returned to the area and coordinated the local severe weather shelter for five years until the COVID-19 pandem pandemic changed the county sheltering model. She is quite familiar with the social services and housing landscape locally and is excited to be working to expand services and housing options for our local youth. Please give Celeste a warm welcome and your undivided attention. Yay. Well, thank you all. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces, although different to not see you all in the little meeting room there on campus. <laughs> uh, it's nice to hear you guys get to go back to that shortly. That must be pretty relieving for these meetings. Um, Thank you for that introduction, Janet. I'm going to try not to just repeat like verbatim some of what you just said. So <laughs> I'll just launch into talking a little bit about what Second Home is and Second Home's history, and then just like open it up to questions from you all. I think there might yeah, maybe questions on a variety of things here. Um, but Second Home is a program that I've been working for. So I guess just to put it on a timeline, I interviewed for Second Home for a part-time position coordinating Western Washington County. Uh, it was the first funding that Second Home got to focus specifically on the west side to so like Cornelius West in Washington County. Um, I interviewed on March 18th, 2020. Uh, and well, basically received this job and closed the doors to the severe weather shelter at UCC and Emanuel Lutheran by the end of the next week. And then like everything about what this position was changed <laughs> as the pandemic rolled through and just how, well, just literally how we approach social services uh, shifted pretty drastically the last 14 months here. Um, but Second Home has been around in Beaverton. Uh, it was actually founded in Beaverton by a McKinney Vento liaison. Um, it's like for fun, show of hands, who knows what a McKinney Vento liaison is? Okay, well, uh, McKinney Vento Liaison is, a, a, the McKinney Vento program is the federal program for homeless students. Um, it was established in like the late eighties. It's the funding that just really does anything for any student that's identified in, as homeless that's in a public school district, that's enrolled in a public school district. Um, so every public school district in the United States has a McKinney Vento Liaison assigned to them. That's the person that's essentially the case manager or advocate for any students experiencing housing insecurity within a given district. Um, here in Forest Grove, our McKinney Vento liaison is David Perro. And Forest Grove's lucky enough to have a McKinney Vento liaison that is full-time dedicated to his job. So that's, there was enough funding in Forest Grove to be able to get a full-time employee. Um, David has been working in the school district I want to say like 15 to 17 years, but I might be exaggerating a little bit there. He's been around a very long time. I had the pleasure of working with him when I was running the Severe Weather Shelter. So it's been nice to be able to work closer with him to provide some resources for our housing and secure students of Forest Grove. Um, just kind of a note on that. He is a bit unique in Western Washington County. He's the only McKinney Vento liaison in our three districts on this side. So Forest Grove, Gaston, um, North Plains and Banks. All of the McKinney Vento liaisons share like two to three different job titles within the school districts because of how funding flows through our state. Uh, so just kind of conceptualizing what it would be like to try to track both all of the um, housing and secure students for a school district, as well as possibly be the superintendent of the middle school and like a full-time coach, for example. So those are the kind of split times that some McKinney Vento liaisons are having out in the world. Uh, Anyhow, back to what that means to us <laughs> right now in Second Home. So the McKinney Vento Liaison in Beaverton reached out to Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon about 14 years ago and was like, I'm seeing a huge spike in youth homelessness. Um, 
you know, it's not just families that are becoming homeless with young children, it's uh, teenagers that are losing their housing or families that are losing their housing or not being able to get into housing that's adequate for them. So teenagers are having to break off and kind of try to fend for themselves while the rest of the family is able to attain housing somewhere else. Um, and so Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon uh, had been kind of interested in doing a host home program in the past. They put a little bit of funding towards a part-time coordinator for Beaverton. Uh, host home recruitment started in Beaverton in like 2000 nine, I guess, as I think the first host home recruitment out there. Um, and now Beaverton's continuously had a host home program going. There's a coordinator focused in Beaverton, Tiger, Tualatin, um, and that still tends to be our highest caseload of youth and also our like real hub of most host homes that have been recruited. Uh, since then, Second Home expanded into the Gresham Barlow School District, so like the east side of Multnomah County. We now have funding. We have one rural coordinator working on like kind of the southern edge of Clackamas County and another part-time coordinator working on the like northern half of Clackamas County and then myself over here in western Washington County. I'm 0.5 western Washington County, 0.5 Lincoln County. So I've also been spending some time over in Lincoln County on the coast. Um, first focusing on host home recruitment. So like at its root, that's what Second Home does is it recruits individuals with Rotary. I was thinking this as I was uh, listening to you guys do your business, but I uh, was a Rotary Foreign Exchange student uh, in high school. And it was definitely why I'm kind of familiar with the idea of host homing in the first place and why that was like a fairly comfortable place for my brain to go as a service provider, um, because I was hosted by a variety of strangers throughout the country of Brazil <laughs> for my entire junior year of high school. Um, and it was great, it was a wonderful experience. Thank you Florence Rotary Club for that in my life. Uh, and so that is like, I mean, minus the exchange part, like minus the cultural exchange and add like safety and security to finish high school. And that's what Second Home is doing. Uh, we're finding people with spare bedrooms and areas that would be willing to host mostly high school age students for long enough for them to complete their diploma um, or their GED or kind of whatever stage of education they're in. We've started to work with some students in the Gresham Barlow area that are actually beginning. Um, Voc training programs are trying to get like the first year of a community college or something like that. So specifically working with people, young people, people under 22 um, that have a specific educational goal they're trying to obtain and they need like secure housing in, in the area that that educational goal is taking place in. Um, we definitely got a little bit of flexibility during the pandemic with students hosting students outside of their like school district of origin because everything was online. And, so it didn't really matter as much all of a sudden physically where students were located, but definitely as stuff comes back online, like just the, it's very easy for a student to lose their housing in an area, but not lose the rest of the support they might have in a community. So like just because housing's become unstable doesn't mean that there's not family, friends, teachers, coaches, um, business owners, community members that that student's connected to that they don't wanna be moved away from in order to seek safe, secure housing. Uh, and that's kind of what Second Home's trying to step in and make sure doesn't have to happen because that's particularly in rural areas. That's what happens. Uh, you know, people's living situation spirals until it is what we kind of visualize as being homeless, right? It spirals to on the street, like visible um, housing and security as opposed to the invisible housing and security that a lot of community members face. Um, but if we can intervene before that visible homelessness happens, uh, you can really do a ton for maintaining mental health, maintaining um, community engagement, maintaining, well, just your life, you know, if you don't have to move away from everything else you've established in your life in order to find a safe roof, you really get to, uh, well, you get to keep moving forward with your life instead of starting it over um, in a lot of ways. And so that's what Second Home is trying to do for young people in, more rural areas of Oregon, as well as um, in some of the urban centers. Uh, and that to say, post home recruiting looks a lot different out here. Like I can't find the, uh, the magic key to what host home recruiting looks like in the more rural areas, uh, specifically out here in Lincoln County. Um, I've had a little bit more luck in recruiting in Lincoln County than I have had in Western Washington County, which has been pretty surprising to me in a number of ways. Um, 
but I don't currently have a single host home in Western Washington County. So any youth that is referred to me, I am having to coach them through like leaving this area or coaching them through calling on a different family member or a different family friend to try to maintain their stability out here for long enough to recruit um, some host homes or you know, for something else to change for that used to have another option. Um, and yeah, I think that's where I'll end my spiel and uh, clarify anything that I may have gone over too fast or answer any questions or, yeah, please. Audience feedback time, these little Zoom lands. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you, how you qualify for a host home? Like what, what kind of, uh, what are you looking for? Uh, on the host side, I'm looking for people that are, well, people that have like an extra room, <laughs> like the student needs to be able to have their own bedroom um, and it's access to shared spaces. Uh, so, you know, it is like taking on, it's a little bit of a combination of taking on a roommate and a foster system, a foster of sorts. Uh, we rely on Oregon revised statute. I can't list off the numbers, uh, but there is legal precedent in Oregon for 16 and ups to sign their own rental agreements, um, independent of their legal guardian, uh, or 15 if pregnant or nursing, or excuse me, pregnant or with a child. Um, and so that's what we are working with, is we're working with that. We're working with host homes that are willing to sign. Uh, we're looking for people that are willing to sign a rental agreement with a young person that needs a stable place to stay. Um, in lieu of rent, uh, in lieu of paying the host home rent, the young person agrees to continue with their educational goals, um, you know, participate in like reasonable chores or household like duties and to maintain contact with the second home coordinator. Um, and that's, that's really pretty much it. We were really flexible with host homes. So we have some host homes that, uh, you know, are, are, you know, have students in the same school district from the school students they're hosting. And so they do a lot of rides. They tend to be a little bit more hands-on with the students. We have other hosts that they're, they don't have any students, you know, they don't have any kids themselves. Um, and they, you know, hosts can require that a student has their own transportation, for example. Hosts can require that students, um, you know, have, uh, well, I guess transportation is the biggest one that comes up. You know, pets, no pets. You know, that's like a pretty common question for a host home is the student allowed to come in with a pet or not have a pet, um, then what are the expectations around having a pet <laughs> if the host home is okay with the student having a pet? Uh, and all of that's worked out. So once a host, once somebody's interested in becoming a host, they would meet with me. I would talk to them about why they're interested in hosting a little bit. Eventually I would wanna come look at the space they'd be hosting the student in. So do a little informal like walk around the property, take some pictures and basically start creating a little like advertisement of the host space that I then would take to students that are looking for housing. And if the host space seems like a good fit to a student, then there's a uh, student fills out an application, lists references on that application. The hosts can contact the student's references directly and talk to them about, you know, how their reference feels they would be as a host. So very, very similar to rental applications and putting a reference on a rental application. Like that's what we're really trying to prepare our students for that formal rental process once they're 18 and in it through how the host home mediation and rental agreement process goes. Um, then ultimately the host home and the student work with, out here you would work with a mediator from the Hillsborough Center for Resolution and Dialogue. And there's a template for a living agreement that's gone through and that becomes a legal signed, legally signed rental agreement. There are 30 days. Um, so it just automatically is a month by month agreement. Uh, of course, termination we don't hold I mean yeah we have not had a situation where we're trying to really enact a uh, renter's rights or landlord tenant law um if a student doesn't feel it's a good fit anymore if a host doesn't feel it's a good fit anymore the second home coordinator will come in and start talking to the student about what other options there are or if it's something that can be mediated and resolved we start trying to tackle that um yeah how do you, or where do you get your referrals and how many kids are there in our area? We know there's about 57 unaccompanied youth in the Forest Grove School District, um, right around 150 considered homeless, 
satisfy the full definition of homeless unaccompanied within the federal definition of homelessness unaccompanied youth means a youth that's not currently in contact with their legal parent or guardian um and that the unaccompanied youth is kind of specifically what second home was designed for and where we kind of focus um so yeah, I mean, those are the numbers I've talked to in the last year. I've personally talked to seven youth that were interested in a host home uh, within the Forest Grove School District. Uh, two of those youth ended up moving into Beaverton into host homes we had available and three of them um, are in loose contact with me still. Uh, and recruitment, oh, the students get referred mostly from the McKinney Vento liaison, um, that school district homeless liaison. I had a couple of students that just heard about me kind of through other people's knowledge of me as a ad advocate out here through the shelter work like that. So there's a couple of people that were related to people that knew me through the shelter that then were just wondering what I was doing for youth services. <laughs> so I had those conversations with them. Um, I have more questions, but I don't want to take time away if other people have questions as well. It's not, so it sounds like most of these youth are not in contact with their biological family. Is that what, what you said? Not necessarily. Um, you can be in contact with all sorts of members of your biological family without your birth parents necessarily being there and being a part of it. Um, also unaccompanied can often mean that they're just, their biological parents or whoever their legal guardian is doesn't have space for them wherever they're living. Um, and that oftentimes is restricted by housing voucher legalities or um, legalities around how many people can occupy, uh, how many bedrooms in a given house. So there's um, one of the actually number one reasons that students come into second home is because their family is living in a, uh, you know, an income restricted unit of some kind or living on a voucher, a housing voucher of some kind. And then they have a new addition to the family um, and that puts them over the limit for family members to keep the voucher, to keep their house in. And so then if the teenager, basically the oldest person in that family can find somewhere else to go, the rest of the family gets to stay in their housing. Um, and so as soon as that teen isn't living in that apartment anymore, they're an unaccompanied minor. They might be talking to their parent every day. They might still be part of taking care of younger siblings. They just can't physically be in that apartment or that house or else the rest of the family risks losing it. Um, or I guess like the top three reasons kind of that we work with is parents getting either arrested. Uh, yeah, so housing limitations, like limitations around legalities of housing and housing vouchers and mem numbers of family members you can have living in a given place or a parent getting arrested or a parent getting deported. Um, and then oftentimes in the cases of arrest or deportations, there's no impetus on either of those systems to find the person's children before they take them. Um, and so then we get students that show up at school, you know, to find out they don't actually have a parent available to them anymore. Um, and then they get referred into housing or tried to troubleshoot other family members that can take them or uh, friends they can stay with um, until something else opens up, yeah. Is there um, other support for the their needs as far as like clothing, school stuff, food that, that is part of this program? Uh, pretty much all of our students qualify for food stamps. So it's a matter of getting them signed up for and advocating. In some cases, advocating to have benefits taken out of parents' names and put in the youth's names. Um, if, oh, yeah, there's a, uh, within the state uh, system, there is food, clothing, and uh, oh, utility assistance that is just pretty readily available for unhoused minors. But a lot of times, those benefits are in whoever their parent or guardian's name was. So it's a matter of going back to the state, going to the Department of Human Services and letting them know that the student is now, you know, is not receiving support from their guardian. So to get those benefits put in their names. And again, Oregon has protections around 16 year olds. That's a, kind of the golden thing about us working with 16 and up or 15 if you're pregnant or uh, parenting is that Oregon already has protections for that age or classification to be able to get their own benefits in their name. Um, and we have a pretty robust volunteer team also that covers 
you know, that meets meets gaps. Uh, we have gift cards on deck. So if we really are and students, um, I haven't personally been a part of moving a student that didn't have like their own stuff. Like you know, maybe it was a matter of going back to some other property to retrieve the student stuff and move it to the host home. But uh, uh, they're not like desolate coming into this program. Um, And there also is other services, like there's not housing for young people, but Homeplate has robust funding for all sorts of stuff. So does Safe Place, um, Boys and Girls Aid, like there's two other service agencies that have a decent amount of funding for this area um, to, to provide, you know, provide adequate clothes for jobs, provide transportation funding, um, which is a tough one because there's no funding to like buy a student a car, which for our area, is kind of like what you need for transportation, basically, <laughs> unless you just like happen to be right on a bus line. Um, but kind of short of like vehicles themselves, we're pretty well networked to be able to provide anything else a student might need. Um, All right, are there any other questions out there? Is there an average length of stay how, how huh. variable is the length of stay? They seem to sit between three and nine months, kind of just literally depending on where the school year is in cycle. Um, as a lot of our students come in their senior year and then stay with their host homes until they graduate their senior year of high school. Um, that being said, I guess we just worked through two different extensions this last week with Beaverton students um, that had just graduated high school and now they've gotten into uh, colleges and the host homes agreed to you know let them stay they're extending their rental agreement for another year for them to get a year of college under their belt and that is that I mean I've been surprised by how common that is because I do come from pretty crisis and not pretty I come from like straight crisis services with um pretty highly traumatized people uh this job with second home is definitely the less least crisis and least trauma I've dealt with uh with the clientele and with the people we're working with. So it does just tend to lead to longer term stays, some deeper relationship building. Um, we have a couple of host homes. Some of our original host homes in Beaverton are on their like sixth, sixth and seventh student respectively. And they're still in contact. They have like family dinners going back like four or five students that they've hosted in the past who are all throughout the Portland metro area now. Living, living their own lives, <laughs> having like, having that couple of years of stability from like seventeen to nineteen it can just make li a literal world of difference in what the rest of your life looks like. So it varies. Sorry, long answer. It really does vary. But like a school year is kind of average. I, I think that was a great, a great answer and a great way to kind of wrap up just how essential having stable housing at kind of the end of your structured educational life uh, is for continued success throughout your life. Very much so. Yeah, that, that senior year of high school and that next year after just means so much for how you get judged the rest of your, the rest of your adult life. <laughs> um. Well, well, thank you, Celeste, for uh, coming today. I'm sure we'll have you back again in the future, but um, this, this program that you're with now sounds really important and uh, I'm glad that they have you and all of your experience and strength working in, in this field to uh, make an impact. So. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you all for having me again. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, let me know if there's anyone else I could talk to, if anyone wants to be a host home. <laughs>